All right, tonight we're going to be looking at, and I've been calling this woman by name of Maria. I'm probably going to do it because it's been in my head for years, but as I was looking and watching videos and reading books and stuff, it's uh, Mariah. So um, if I make the mistake, I'll just call her Edder, and then I won't make the mistake. But anyway, this woman, probably haven't heard of her either. Now remember last week we talked about Dowie, Alexander Dowie, and, um, and not many people have heard from him be about him because of, he was controversial. <coughs> Toward the end he thought he was Elijah, and so people just wrote him off rather than looking at all that he accomplished and the healings and, the, and all of that that were legitimate. Um, you got to give room for people to screw up and you know do things that aren't necessarily right so we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. this woman you haven't heard of but there's really no scandal attached to her and there hasn't been a greater demonstration of God's spirit and power since the book of Acts in Pentecostal history than Mariah Woodworth Etter you're going to see there's a lot of stuff that's happening in, in this woman's ministry. She was an incredible woman of vision and spiritual strength who stood in the face of fierce opposition, lifted her tiny hand to the Holy Spirit to spread the fire. She lived in the realm of the Spirit as a powerful vessel of God's divine healing and uh, supernatural manifestations. Now here's what, I want, what we're looking at, and the reason why we're doing these particular people um, together is because they all lived around the same time. And I want you to kind of get a feel of that era of um, all that was taking place. So let's go back to Welsh Revival, 1904 to 1906, Evan, Rob Evan Roberts. The Azusa Street Revival, William Seymour, 1906 to 1910. Um, three and a half years, two years, three and a half years, these were revivals. And they overlapped a little bit there, you can see that. Alexander, um, John Alexander Dowie, born 1847, 1907, so toward the end of his life, um, these revivals were going on, and there's nothing that we can see that, that mentions that he even attended. This was, of course, in Wales, but he never went to the Azusa, although he was up and down the West Coast. Don't know why he didn't go, and um, maybe he was too too far into his, toward the end of his life. I don't know. But uh, Mariah Woodworth Etter, born 1844, and she dies 1924, so she's also alive <coughs> during these revivals, and she's up and down the coast of California, but we don't have anything where she went to the Azusa either. So that's kind of a question to me. I'm, I, I've never really heard anybody talk about that. But again, so um, next week we're going to look at John G. Lake. He was alive. Um, or maybe we'll look at Amy Simple McPherson because she was friends with Mariah. So we may look at her, then John, but these were all alive at the same time. So it's crazy that, that, that it was like God was pouring out His Spirit and people were grabbing it, individuals, and leading revivals and, and, and healings and, and deliverance and <clears throat> manifestations of the Spirit and people getting saved and so forth and so on. So again, she's born in 1844. She's born in Ohio. Um, I think you got that right there. Um, Lisbon, Lisbon, Ohio. Her dad was an alcoholic, abusive, and so she wasn't raised in a very good home. So she um, struggled in that. But when she was um, at the age of 13, she had a, um, an encounter with God and went up front and the preacher prayed over her. And he had a word for her that she would be a bright and shining light. And he had no clue who he was prophesying over, but she ends up being that and even more. Now, she will immediately dedicate her life to the Lord at the age of 13. Um, because of, her, of the calling she would later write she, um, she said she heard a voice of Jesus calling her to go out into the highways and byways and gather in the lost sheep at this time only one thing could stop her and this is the, one of the reasons why you haven't heard of her is because she was a woman and had this been a man you would have heard from, of her because back then women weren't even allowed to vote let alone speak in churches and denominations weren't really pleased about women ministering so forth and so on so anyway um, you know this is in the mid, uh, mid 19th century but um, she decided she would have to um, 
marry a missionary, the closest thing she could get to the ministry, it would be to marry a missionary to fulfill her call. So she planned to continue her education, enter you know, college if she could, and make herself ready. But tragedy struck her home. Her father was killed out working in the farm, and she had to go return home to help support her family. So she didn't get that education she wanted. She didn't get to marry the missionary or anything like that. Her hopes of formal education was shattered, so she settled into what she thought was going to be the normal Christian life. So during this time, the Civil War was coming close to an end, and she met a guy, and his, of course his name's Woodworth, where, where she gets the, the middle name there. Um, but anyway, um, he had returned home from the Civil War with a, with a um, he was discharged because of a head injury, and it was a whirlwind <coughs> courtship, and the uh, former soldier uh, and her married, and um, they had together about they had they had together about six children, so boom 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 six children, and um, and life was going good you know the farm wasn't going well so they weren't making a lot of money, so again you know, struggling during that time a lot of people struggled, and she tried to settle in, um, but anyway over the years she'd end up having the six kids, and five of those kids would die of a disease leaving her with only one child which would be a girl and so tragedy struck that family she eventually recovered losing boom you know those kids just left boat right down boom 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 and then um, having the one kid she survives but her husband uh, never really recovered from that devastation of losing all those kids just like you know <coughs> over that disease whatever it was um, but she's able to pull herself together she starts seeking the Lord searching the scriptures and um, she began to discover that God was using women in the Bible. And she thought, well, wait a minute. I can't, get, I can't be used in the church, but I'm seeing God using women in the Bible. So that kind of went along with the calling that she had gotten of going to the highways and byways. And so, um, so God gives her a vision. Angels come into her room one night, and they took her to the west over prairies in this vision and forests and rivers where she saw a long wide field of golden grain and as the view unfolded she began to preach and she saw these grains begin to fall like sheaves and she realized that she would never be happy until she yielded to the call but, she, but the key was that she saw these grains falling and she really didn't know what that was she just knew that that was the harvest and she was called to, to preach the gospel and, and so she yielded to that call so then Jesus told her as she saw the grain fall that the people that she would preach to would also fall. So she went, ah, I get it now. And so she said yes to, she finally committed to the call that she got a while back. So she launched her ministry. Now watch this because this falling of the sheaves that God said when you preach the people are going to fall. And um, at that time there, you know, this this is this is somewhere in what 40, 57, 67. See, we haven't gotten to the turn of the century yet, and so these these um, Pentecostal movements and things of that nature. Um, Charles Parham, which got to add him there because he was also alive during that time. We'll have to hit him too. But um, so there was not a lot of Pentecostal movement. There was not a lot of things happening like that. So this falling <clears throat> was something that she wasn't accustomed to. We would go, oh yeah, we've been in meetings like that. We're, we, we know what that, but not her. So she launches her ministry in her own community. She had no idea what, what she would say. So she trusted the Holy Spirit. Again, this is another one that trusted what the Spirit was doing and did not come like Evan Roberts did and um, Seymour. After this, she began to um, be highly sought. People began to um, fall to the ground just as the, as the Lord told her. She, would, she was just strictly evangelism, but when she preached the gospel, people would just come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they would just fall out. And she's just like, okay, I know this is right because I saw it in a vision. And so after, she began, she was high, after this, she began to be a highly sought in her own community. And uh, several churches asked her to come and revive their congregations. So she expanded her ministry toward the West and held nine revivals, preached 200 sermons, and started, to, and started two churches with, many Sunday, with, with, with Sunday school classes, membership going over 100 people. So that Sunday school was something new back then. Um, so if one particular meeting she held, um, it was a revival in a town called 
Uh, this is where I've gotten to, so I'm going to give you both, and only the God knows which one really happened. So because this particular denomination she was with, um, they really didn't want her preaching because she was a woman, and so, but she was adamant about it. Now this is one story, so I'm going to give it to you. And so they sent her to a place where no one had any success. <coughs> and it was called, the, and it was such a bad place, they called it the, de the, the devil's den. So they thought, well, we'll get rid of her, send her over there, and she'll fail miserably like everybody else has, and then she'll just give up on this call, this ministry. We won't have to deal with her anymore as a woman in, the, in that particular denomination. Um, that's one story. The other story was that she was so on fire for God and saw the miraculous happening, she wanted to go to the worst place that you could go and, 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 and preach the gospel, and that would be the devil's den. So how she got there, that's two different stories. I, I can't tell you which one it was. So it's either one or the other. But she goes to this place called the, um, the devil's den. Now, when she gets there, you have to understand there's no radio, there's no radio, there's no TV, there's really nothing going on, so everything that was live entertainment, everybody went to. But specifically, they would go to this meeting because it's a woman, and they ain't <coughs> never seen a woman preacher. And they don't like a woman preacher. So a lot of them went there to mock, to ridicule, to, to, to joke, to make fun, or, or what have you. So the place was packed, and, and so again, this is that place, the devil's den. But what happened was she had success there after a couple meetings, and revival hit that town. Great, powerful manifestations of the Spirit was happening, and souls were coming to the Lord. So she turned that community upside down. And it wasn't until she preached at a church in western Ohio that um, they had lost, this particular church had lost God's power. And um, so they went to her to, to kind of, you know, Revive us. And it was at this church that the meaning of her vision about the sheaves of wheat became crystal clear to her. It was at this church where the people fell into trances. And this was one spiritual manifestation that marked her ministry greatly, but it brought great persecution. Now, when you get into trances, there are like three or four different ways. And, in, in, you know, you can go to the Bible and see Peter had one when he went up to the roof to, uh, he said to the people, hey, I'm going to go up the roof to pray. Um, uh, we'll be back to, to yell for me when, there's, when, when lunch or dinner is going to be ready. So he breaks away from the crowd. He goes up on the roof, and um, he goes into this trance. And when he's in this trance, he, he sees a vision. And it's all the unclean animals that they're not allowed to eat, Jews. And God says, arise and eat. That's what the vision said to him. He said, Lord, I'm not going to eat what's unclean. And God <laughs> said, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And so that was a vision because guess who's coming in the matter of minutes to look looking for Peter was Cornelius's household heard the Lord to go get Peter and um, and he's a Gentile. He's an Italian Gentile. And so Peter was not going to go because he fought that. He didn't want to go. And God said, you're calling these Gentiles unclean. I have cleansed them. I told you to go to the Gentiles. And so this came, this vision, and Peter was forced out of his um, racism, if you will, whatever you want to call it, because the Jews did not like the Gentiles. They called them dogs in every name you can in the book. And so he would have never, ever ventured out of Jerusalem to take the gospel to the Gentiles if he didn't have that trance. So there's all kinds of, you'll see that in the, in, in the, in the Bible, you're going to see it in, in um, and even in the early church, if you, if you look up the early church, um, there were a lot of mystics that had these. But the thing about this is, she said, these are things I'm not accustomed to seeing, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see some of the stuff here as we go through. She says, but the reason why I am not stopping it is because these people are falling out in trances and they are coming back to their feet and the glory of God is all over them and they are running to the altar to, to get converted. And she says, and they're getting healed. I'm not, not, not getting healed yet. That doesn't happen. They're getting saved. They're getting delivered. 
there are a lot of manifestations happening and, and people are just from these people falling out. Now these trances are a result of what God told her, when you speak, they're going to fall out. And they're not just going to fall out. How many people seen you people fall out in the spirit and they write back up in about two minutes? Five at the most. These, these were trances. Whereas they would lay there for an hour, two hours, three hours. They would throw water on them because at first we're like, are they dead? We can't even tell if they died. And they wouldn't come to. They were out. But when they came back, they would come back saying they saw visions. And they, they would run to the altar, as I said earlier. So anyway, this is something new. But it didn't bother her because she saw it in a vision that with these sheaves falling out. And God says, when you preach, they will fall out. Now, let me just say this. Do you remember um, when Har Rodney Howard Brown came through in the 90s and there was that laughter that was taking place? And then there was gold dust taking place and there was just manifestations in the 90s and up to 2000 that, were, that, that you didn't see in services or revivals or special meetings prior to that. Now, there's always been laughter, but not in our generation since I was in church I got saved in 78 so I never that laughter that <coughs> holy laughter never took place till the 90s but it had if you do any if you do research back you'll you'll see that they had that manifestation well just like Rodney Howard Brown had the manifestation of um, laughter someone else may have the manifestation of the, the gold dust or um, we were at a meeting um, a John Sheesby meeting and um, the and I knew the girl, and they weren't very well off, and she had, he felt like somebody was getting their teeth filled with gold feelings, and um, so she every she, she said, hey, everybody look in each other's mouth and see if they, and so this girl says, hey, and you, and we all looked at it, saw it in my own eyes, and it, it's it was lined with gold, whereas it, it, uh, what's the other mercury? It's silver. This is gold. I saw it. And she had never had that work on her teeth at all. So, so these are different manifestations, but Mar Mariah Woodworth Edder, hers was trances. That was the manifestation as Rodney Howard Brown's was um, laughter. This one was trances. And the fact of it is, people say that's demonic, they mocked it, whatever, but these people were coming out of them with shining with the glory of God all over them, and then the fruit of their lives proved that it wasn't the devil doing that. Anyway, so um, people had never seen anything like this. This was a powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Trances became the talk of the day. As I said, as laughter was in our time. Um, some would mock and be struck down by the power of God and get on their knees and repent. One man who had this encounter after getting off of the floor coming out of the trance, he regretted having spent 60 years lost in religion, never knowing Jesus Christ personally, but went to church all his life. Still newspapers, and here we go with the newspapers. Again, when you got the newspapers that are doing everything they can to criticize you, like Dowie, and then they have to come there and admit what they're seeing, and then it gets documented. There are, there are newspaper clippings proving that a lot of this stuff was legit. Um, so anyway, still the newspapers and unbelieving ministers warned others to stay away from these meetings. They would tell people if they went, they would become insane, or they might just possibly fall out and die literally died. <laughs> Nevertheless, with that bad press, thousands were saved and many were struck down laying as dead men even on their way home after the meeting they get hit, on the way to the meeting they get hit, but um, this, this power went wherever they, you know, went beyond the building. Now her meetings and the style was different than what you would be normal, what you would be um, accustomed to during that time. She never prohibited the audience from participating, though. There was shouting, dancing, singing, and preaching. She, never, she believed that emotional displays were important as long as they were in order. Now, churches in that day restricted people from being open into freely expressing themselves. So again, you, church, let me, I, I don't know if you've ever heard the, the, the preaching back in that day when they finally did get audio, and a lot of it's scratchy. Um, bad audio, but you can hear them. They, it's not like the preaching today. It was stern. It was monotone. Most read their sermons, and it was just like you—you you would be 
bored. You would just be like, oh my God, is it like a professor in a lecture? Um, I, I don't like it, you know. So our preaching has changed back, you know, from, from there. So the style back then, it was no one participated. You came, you sat, you listened, and you went home. And they had, a, you had an altar call, but it was only to repent and get your life right. And hopefully you, you cried a little bit and had some remorse and everybody was happy. But her meetings, people were participating, they were shouting, they were jumping, they were dancing. And when people came and saw that, that's not church. Uh, that's just like if you're accustomed to what, you know, whatever church you're in and you're accustomed to everything being the same every Sunday, and then the Spirit moves and people are doing things they don't normally do, and things are happening you don't normally see, well then you're gonna have, to, to have to deal with that. Either you're gonna trust that it's the Lord, or you're gonna say it's the devil, and then you know, every one of us is gonna have that happen, whatever we are accustomed to and we see the change. But anyway, uh, that's something we have to be open to because look, it's not, <clears throat> when the spirit moves, anything can happen. All right, but in this case, you know, this this was a different manifestation um, than what the Welsh revival was experiencing. The Azusa Street revival. Dowie is going to really lambast her because of the stuff that's happening in her meetings. So anyway, the style was different, and um, churches in that day restricted people. So again, she would say that the churches must have a fresh move of God. And like it or not, a move of God affects the emotions of people, and you're going to have that. She would say that the churches um, needed to be open to what the Spirit was doing, more trust the Spirit more than formality. She believed if you focused on the true, the false will fade away. So by the time she reached the age of 40, um, she was a national phenomenon. People from all walks of life were coming to know the Lord from Doctors, lawyers, drunkards, adulterers, all kinds of people from all walks of life were being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what one newspaper reporter said. Now this is, a, this is an article found in the newspaper. She goes at it like a, now I don't, I don't know what this is. You might, this is, this is the kind of language <coughs> from back then. I don't know what this stuff is. She's, she goes at it like a foot pad tackle, his prey by some supernatural power. She just knocks them silly when they are not looking for it. And while they are down, she applies the hydraulic pressure and pumps the grace of God into them by the bucket <laughs> full. And so that's, that's what one guy, newspaper guy, said when he went there to check it out. So the Lord would eventually get her to um, pray for the sick, though she was reluctant at first because she thought that if she would introduce divine healing, it would take away from people getting saved. So she, she kicked back at it. But she felt like the Lord said, you need to start praying for the sick. Well, nobody was really doing that during that time. And again, you know, people were being healed. Um, but she wasn't, she, I don't think, all it was was just hearsay. But no one was really doing it. Because remember, she, he's born in 1847. She's born in 1844. These are the only two, actually, at the time, that were literally preachers traveling. This, these are revivals. But these were the only two where you would go to their meeting and see things like that happening, divine healing. So um, she she starts, okay, Lord, I'm, I, that's she saw it in the Bible. People were being healed. So she says, okay, and she went with it. And so she began to start praying for the sick, reluctant at first, but she ended up doing it. And um, but it didn't take long to see that evangelism and healing would go hand in hand. Thousands were coming to Christ as a result of seeing people healed. And um, her ministry was a demonstration of power, combining proclamation and demonstration. And one me now I'm not going to be able to exhaust. I mean, they said there's so many miracles and healings and stuff that took place. It was it's impossible to put it all in one one book, or it would be a really too big of a book to read. So there's all kinds of accounts, accounts that people don't even know of. But anyway, one meeting over 25,000 people attended. The power of God fell on the multitude and took control of about 500 of those people and they fell to the ground and um, again just wiped them out fallen out of course persecution and controversy followed her everywhere she went but while in Oakland California her husband started flirting around with her staff she had women's staff 
And so this husband that really didn't recover from this, from five of the six kids that had died started flirting with the staff, but nothing, <clears throat> nothing big. But he ends up having an affair. If that, you know, this is this is back in the day. No, you know, you don't you don't get divorced, you don't commit adultery. I mean, you really got hammered. And this was during the Jim Crow laws. So even though Lincoln had um, did you know set set the slaves free, they, they weren't even close to being free. But um, but on top of the fact that he he cheated on her, he cheated on her with an African American woman, and she ends up separating from him, living in a different bedroom but he kept it all up she said look I, you're not going to stop so she ends up just leaving him and divorcing him where he marries that girl and then they go off and go her way now she's divorced that's another tragedy that hits her something she has to deal with so in january of 1891 they were divorced and in less than a year and a half he remarried like i said well a year and a half he remarried and um went around publicly slandering mariah her character and ministry and but it wasn't long after that that he died in 1892 so he'd only been married a year at the most probably less than a year remarried as he went on this um, de de denouncing his ex-wife and saying all kinds of things about her but he dies he dies of typhoid fever all right her greatest trials came on the west coast she believed um, the West Coast would be one to God. She somehow, and again, this is one of those things you're never going to know for sure, but she prophesied the, of the San Francisco earthquake <clears throat> and um, didn't get the date right, but said that, that, that the West Coast was going to get hit. Well, it, it did. Um, it, it, one of the biggest earthquakes in San Francisco. She purchases an 8,000 seat tent and soon the tent was jammed with onlookers coming to see the trances hear of the visions and watch all the other manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So people were coming to see this demonstration of power and then being affected by it. Perse persecution, of course, came by way of gangs, hoodlums, when they started <coughs> harassing her meetings, planning explosives, but nobody got hurt. Threats were sent to her weekly, death threats. Newspapers slandered her relentlessly. And she also got arrested too, like Dowie did, because the, you know, practicing medicine without a license, which of course that's not what they're doing. So she got arrested several times also uh, for doing that. So um, many were, um, many more persecutions arose, but she refused to leave that area of Oakland. Gangs began to get the upper hand at her meetings, so the Oakland Police Department deputized bouncers to protect the services, but this got out of control because the bouncers were inexperienced both in character and in common sense. So this just gives you an idea of this just wasn't an easy cakewalk. I mean, even, even traveling as now a single woman, you gotta remember there's no interstates. So when you're going to city to city and you're driving all night to get there, you're going through some really rough neighborhoods or back country, rural area, car breaks down, moonshiners. I mean, the roads are bouncing and all. I mean, it's just not easy to be an evangelist during that time if you're not traveling uh, more than sophisticated trains or whatever. But um, they, they didn't have a lot of money, so everywhere they went was in a car. So, but anyway, keep that in mind. So here comes Mr. Dowie. Now, here's this is interesting. Dowie joined her critics, and you got a picture of them too. All right. So Dowie joined her critics and publicly blasted her trance evangelism, calling it a great delusion. No other minister matched his ministry except her. Here's her statement about Dowie. Now this is written, this is documented. This is what she says. After starting in our meeting before thousands, now this is proof, she said, in front of that, because he, came, he, he, he didn't denounce her in the beginning, he was a friend of hers. So she says, after stating in our meeting, before thousands that he never saw much such power of God as so wonderfully manifested and after advertising all his people to stand by me he would he would he went up and down the coast preaching against me and the meetings so in front of thousands of people he endorsed her but when he saw what was going on after the, during the meetings then he denounced her his only objection was that some more 
um, that, 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 the, that, the, that these people were being struck by the power of God. He didn't like the, the, the trance thing. So he lectured against me two or three times in San Francisco and said I was in line with Satan. And uh, many went, went, to, went to hear him, but his talk made the people um, be disgusted with him by denouncing her, and they walked out on his meetings. She says, I told the people, and I'm still quoting her, I told the people that I had been his friend and had treated him like a brother and that he was not fighting me, but that he was fighting the Lord and the word of the Lord. I always told the people that I would leave him in the hands of God and then I would go right on with, the, with, with Jesus. I told them, now watch and see how we will come out, both of us. Look at our ministries and watch how we'll end up. And they would see that he would go down with disgrace and that she would be living way beyond when he died. And that's exactly what happened. You know, he went crazy thinking he was Elijah. But she lived 17 more years after um, Dowie died. So she prophetically got that right. In 1902, she remarried a man named Samuel Etter. There's where you get the, the name. Um, well, it's not up there, but that's where you get Mariah Woodworth Etter. Now she marries this guy named Etter. In 1902, three years after her marriage, um, she just disappears. And for seven years... And when you get to Annie Simple McPherson and see why she disappears, totally different, but that's another one's going to disappear. No one knows why she disappears for seven years. I mean, things are going, and all of a sudden she gets married, boom, she disappears, and no one knows why. But when she came back, when she came back, when she emerged back after seven years, she was just as powerful as before, and this time had a loving, supporting husband with her. So she was, again, like I said, arrested for um, practicing without a license, and she was arrested for, I think in Pittsburgh, I think she was arrested for <coughs> healing, charging people to get healed. Because you're going to take up offerings and people get, and she's like, that's not what, you're, that's not how that works. It may look like that to you, but, that, but nevertheless, they arrested her. Um, she couldn't fill in all her invitations to speak because she got so many. One particular one was a meeting by F.F. F. Bosworth in Dallas, Texas. Powerful manifestations resulted in that meeting of healing, deliverance, salvation. One man showed up laying on a cot from tuberculosis. His condition was hopeless. He was um, just laying there, and she prays for him. He comes off of the cot, and he's been there at home on the cot. But when he gets off of that cot and gets healed... He's jumping around and goes back home, riding in the front seat, whereas he was laying in the back seat, going there, leaving. He's, he's up talking, bouncing all around. Another guy had all these ribs. He had a horrible fall, and many of his ribs were broken, and he was on a cot because it was hard to walk, move around. She prays for him. All the bones get healed. He's up jumping around. He's hitting, his, he's hitting where the ribs were broken and nothing, um, just... So again, all kinds of healings, and there's no way I can um, tell you all of them. I didn't, I don't know all of them, but I'm just hitting you, hit, just highlighting some of these. Broken bones were healed. Cancer had eaten this guy's entire face and neck, but when she prayed for him, he was miraculously healed. The deaf and dumb were being healed. People that couldn't speak, couldn't hear, all of a sudden they're hearing, they're see, they're seeing, they're speaking. I mean, we're, we're just talking, I, it, I would just be here all night and you'd get bored with it after a while because this was just going on all the time. It just became common. Now, one woman had a double affliction of cancer and tuberculosis, and she looked like a skeleton. She had lost so much weight. And the best physicians of Dallas had given up on her, and they brought her to him, to, brought her to her, and um, they prayed for her, and she was instantly healed, jumped up from her, from her cot shouting, and she came to the rest of the meetings every night for the rest of the duration that she, that she was there. F. F. Bosworth, who had asked her to come to Dallas, wrote night after night, as soon as the invitations was given, all the available space around the 40-foot altar would be filled with so many suffering, with diseases and afflictions, and others seeking salvation that it was difficult for anybody to get near because of the because of all the needs. <coughs> every meeting was a every meeting was a demonstration of the power of the Spirit like no generation has ever seen. She was asked to come to Los Angeles 
to try to revive the Azusa Street Revival after it had been gone. And this would be 1913. So it had been dead and gone for three years. So they asked her to come to revive what had stopped in 1910, three years later, 1913. Well, she gets there, and it does. It starts picking back up, and again, demonstration of the Spirit and everything. But you have to understand, a lot of this was, uh, was people that was in the Pentecostal movement, and there were different sects of Pentecostalism. And they were all coming out. And so when they were baptizing, um, one said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as you know, they're going down. Well, Jesus only people, the holiness, doesn't believe that you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You should only be baptizing in Jesus only. And, um, and that, theology, that, that doctrine just broke all that movement up. And, um, but again, making it more about theology than um, about what the Spirit of God was doing. Nevertheless, miracles continued in our ministry. People in wheelchairs left and right were coming out and um, walking. So Mariah Woodworth Ether met Amy Simple McPherson, which we'll probably talk about her next week, at the same time. Amy was still the traveling evangelist, and she loved um, Mar Mariah and eagerly desired to meet with her, and, um, and she sat in one of her meetings. Many great speakers of the day visited the tabernacle that Mariah had built. She built herself, uh, finally built herself a, a building, a tabernacle, and people would come there. Um, Smith Wigglesworth may have been there. They don't know for sure, but this is what they do know, that she, he must have watched a lot of her and listened to her because a lot of his um, mannerisms, not mannerisms, but mo things that he would say would be things that she would say and um, that Wigglesworth did conduct a series of meetings in the tabernacle even after she died. So he was at least monitoring, watching. We don't know if they really actually met or not. Um, but the summer of 1924 was difficult for her at the age of 80. With failing health, problems, she received heartbreaking news. Her only daughter that was left got killed in a streetcar accident. I think you'll see a picture of her. Her daughter? Yeah, right there. So she gets killed. So that's the, remember the five of the six get killed. So finally this one. So she loses two husbands, because eventually the other one died. She loses two husbands and all her kids. And she's 80 years old. And her, it's the last, the last year she's alive. She dies at 80. But at 80, she's still preaching. Um, she's still going at it hard. They would even have to carry her to the platform and sit her in a wooden chair until she spoke and then when she spoke she'd get up and then she'd be all over the platform like power of God came on her and then when she was done she'd collapse back into the, wo the wooden chair they made for her and they would carry her out on that chair and um, take her home in it but you know, she still continued all through the pain and suffering of her life. Now here's the amazing thing though you're going to see with these guys they, can't, they, don't, they don't get healed themselves but they, but, they heal other, but they heal other people. Now, we know not them, but God does. You're going to find when we get to Catherine Coleman. Now, she's alive during our time, 70s. She, and I'm telling you, you wait till you get to her because it's just amazing. That's an amazing story. And people were being healed, and she, she didn't like it at first because she was an evangelist. She didn't heal. And I'll just tell you a little bit about her. She doesn't heal. She's just speaking. She's saving people. She's giving them the call, and someone gets healed, and she's like, hey, what's that? She didn't like it at first. No one prayed for the person. No one did. And all of a sudden, people are getting healed, and she's not having an honor call for healing. It was happening in spite of her. So we'll talk about that. But anyway, those are some things to be thinking about. And um, so anyway, she just, this is a woman, and there's a lot of takeaways from that. But during this time, um, she also met John G. Lake, and they were so impressed with her, which we'll get into John G. Lake in a couple of weeks, is that they said, man, when, we, when, when John G. Lake would tell people to pray, he'd say, pray like Mother Etter, pray like Sister Etter, pray because she was powerful when she prayed. And um, so there you go. So anyway, um, I think she met him around 1913, about the time she went tried to get the Zoo Street thing going. So um, here's the deal. What are the lessons we can take away from this? Again, Look at her upbringing, a, 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 an abusive father, an alcoholic father, 
um, poverty stricken just and gets a call but really can't do anything with it because she's a woman and then um, when she decides that she's going to try to get into the ministry through a missionary and go get a formal education her, her father dies and she's got to go back and help raise the family so that that gets blown. <clears throat> so then she marries a guy has those kids five or six of them die <clears throat> They bounce back as best as they can, starts the ministry, and trances start happening. Which that's not what she signed up for, but she saw in a vision. Healing wasn't what she signed up for, but God told her to do it. Then persecution came, like heavily, I mean heavily on her, and everything she did, from newspapers to hoodlums, gangs, all that. And then her husband cheats on her and runs off with another woman. So, I mean, just bam, 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 bam. And then Dowie starts bad-mouthing her. And so it's not, so what do, what do we, the takeaway is, man, this isn't easy. The devil doesn't play fair. He's going, if he, if he sees you as a threat to his kingdom, then he is going to do everything he can to attack, and it's called persecution. And um, that's why Paul said, look, understand, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And that she didn't do that with him. She didn't get into a, a peeing match with him or anything like that. But she just said, I'm just going to sit, forgive him, put him in God's hands, let, and, let, and let God deal with him. And um, because it's, it's the principalities and powers is in, in deceiving these people in flesh and blood that's getting them to do these things. So this, this is a woman that could have gave up at any point in time and said, I'm done. Or here's the big one. I can't believe you did this to my family and start blaming God for something. That never, you don't see that documented with her. She had a good theology. She understood that, that the enemy's out to, God's not the one who's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not the, he's not the one who has the power of death. And um, God's not the one killing the people. You eat from this tree, you die. I ain't doing it. You did it when you ate from that tree and unleashed death and disease on everybody. So it's not God. And so um, go look at the book of Job. Is it God? No, it's the devil that's creating all this havoc in Job's life, killing his family, taking away his livestock, and putting the boils on him. There's no way that he's blaming God on that. Well, he doesn't know, but we know. We're privy to what's going on behind the scenes. And um, everybody else thought it was God. So again, they didn't know. Job didn't know, and his friends, what actually was going on. But we do, because we have the story. But my point is, she didn't get offended at God for the bad that was happening, the evil that was happening, the persecution that was coming. She just kept getting back up and going forward. This woman went to 80 years old with all of that happening to her, and she could have packed it up in her lap. As soon as that woman, the daughter was like, that could have been, that's it, I'm done. I'm already not feeling good. I can't even walk. I, I, you know what? Hanging up, right? Nope. After she dies, she gets and she continues preaching, and they got to put her. They made a wooden chair for her to sit in, and then they picked her up, you know, carried her around in it. And she'd get up and preach, and sit back down and go home. Until it was time to preach again, they'd go put, take the wooden chair, pick her back up, and bring. I guess wheelchairs wasn't that accessible, you know. <laughs> probably would have cost you something. And here's another thing: whereas Dowie had a lot of accusation against him, and if you, and he, and, you know, he would. He lived extravagant and, you know, probably was about the money to some degree. But when her ex-husband said that she was about the money, there was no way to prove that because she lived modestly. There was no way that she it was never about. She said, I'm only charging what it's costing me to do these meetings. I ain't making any money off of it. You know, like whatever her expenses were. But other than that, she did not make any money. So it probably doesn't surprise me that she couldn't afford a wheelchair, that they had to make a wooden chair for her and carry her with no wheels on it. But anyway, so that's one of the takeaways. The other one is, when there's a move of the Spirit, it is not going, it's always going to happen. There's going to be a manifestation, and people aren't going to like it. Rather than saying, wait a minute, what's the fruit? And this is the thing about the laughter when it was happening in the 90s. What's the fruit? Is the fruit of these people being moved by God and, and their lives are being changed? Or are they laughing and getting drunk and having sex and backsliding? 
I, we never saw that. Everybody that was got hit by the Holy Spirit, their lives, it, it was for the better of their lives. And so she said, I am not seeing any negative fruit from these manifestations. In fact, I'm seeing things that could not have happened in people's lives had they not encountered the manifestation. So there's always going to be a um, something in us. Well, I've never seen that before. And we're going to question. That doesn't mean that everything you see is right, but leave that to God. Leave it to God. Don't just say, you know what? Some, some, as we said earlier, some people get it right, some people get it wrong. Paul warned us, we know in part, and we're going to prophesy in part. So no one's going to be exactly right. And so I would rather somebody at least try and be wrong than be too scared to try and the, no one does anything. Crickets. We become cold and stale and there is no move because we're afraid of criticism, afraid of division, afraid of what the Spirit might do and I might lose my job, I might lose money. And that is the case though in a lot of churches today. They're afraid of what might happen. They call for revival, but they're controlling the Holy Spirit when they're saying they believe in revival. Mm -hmm. every, every Sunday, they're just so jam-packed with, with the schedule that the Spirit doesn't have, have a place to move or so forth and so on. But anyway, um, so again, div theology, division can, can stop a move as well. Uh, but here's what I want to leave you with. I heard one guy make a statement and I don't agree with it and I'm going to show you the scriptures um, if, if you got your Bibles go to Galatians and we're only going to be another five minutes Galatians um, chapter 3 and this is Paul defending the gospel called the new covenant um, Galatians now it's going to be six minutes because I don't I don't have it here. Let's go take a minute to find. All right, Galatians chapter. Um, all right, so here's this one guy said it was it was her praying and the call of God that she encountered what in, what she did in the meetings, and I don't I don't agree with because all these meetings, all this, all this, every one of them. Praying was a theme in all of them. And I'm not against the praying. Okay, the people are crying out to God. But you have to you have to go with what the scriptures say, not with what you think happened. And because you see a trend of people praying, that's how you get revival, is through prayer. No, prayer is let me just back up. How do you get revival if it's not, and is prayer involved? And if it is, how is it involved? Let's look at this scripture, and then I'll tell you. Galatians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 5. You, you should know this scripture. We dealt with it a lot since, since we've been doing these meetings here in 2018. Therefore, verse Paul speaking, therefore, verse 5, chapter 3, he who supplies the Spirit to you, and what? Works miracles among you. Now that word miracles is power manifestations. Who works powerfully among you. Which means it could manifest in healing. It could manifest in miracles. It could manifest in anything that has, the, that has to do with the power of God. Okay? So he says, let me ask you a question. He who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So, the question is, does he perform miracles, signs, wonders, manifestations, revival, healing, all that? Does he do it by the works of the law or by faith? But he has hearing in there. The hearing of faith. So this guy says it was her call, and it was because you have to hear a call. Abraham had to hear God speak from heaven. Paul on the road to Damascus had to hear God speak. So faith comes by hearing. So when she hears the call, the call is not a work. A call is not a work. The call is response to what she hears the Father saying to her, where faith comes, and she goes forth with the call. Now where does prayer come in? 
You need the. What do you think she was doing when she got the call? Praying. Yeah. So the prayer did not formulate the call, did it? The prayer unveiled the call. And she heard the call, faith was response, and the call happened. Prayer is involved because you've got to hear what God is doing. Every one of these guys heard God say something and they stepped out with what they heard. Perfect case of point is her. She saw a vision of people falling out. So she, she, received, she let that happen because she had it in a vision. Um, healing. She heard healing should be in your, in your services. She kicked that back, but God convinced her because she heard it. And she's hearing these things, and she's seeing these things because she's praying. So prayer's not making it happen. Prayer is, oh, prayer is that time where she can have her eyes open to see and hear what God is saying and doing. And then when she sees it and hears it, hearing it, seeing it, faith comes. And she'll walk it out. And now people think, oh, it's because she prayed this happened. This was happening by grace. This is what God's freely doing in our midst. And we always want to add a work to it to say this is why it happened. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, now, here's, here's, what, here, here's what I want to leave you with. Israel was going into the promised land. Okay? Promised land. I'm going to do this here. I want you to see this. So let's say this is, this is the promised land. They're on the outside, and they're making their way in. All right. When you wipe, by the way, when you wipe this board down, don't make me write that all that. Yeah. Just, just take that off. We'll see. I want to leave the dates. Otherwise, I got to look those dates up again, like I did tonight. <laughs> Too much work for me. I can't memorize this stuff. So anyway, they're they're on the Israel is they left Egypt. I'm gonna really you know what? Just wipe it all off. I'm gonna mess it all up. <laughs> they left Egypt, and they're going to the Promised Land. Now we know the Promised Land is a type of the all-inclusive Christ. All right, that's where all the promises are. That's where everything's grace, freely given, everything. Live in houses you didn't build, eat from the fruit of the vine you didn't plant. This is where they're going. The first generation, they get there, and they see what in that land? Milk and honey. Well, yeah, they got milk and honey, but what's keeping them from the milk and giants. honey? Giants. <clears throat> they see giants in the land. Okay? And they heard God say, milk and honey, go possess the land. Joshua takes them in. But they have an identity crisis. They see themselves as what? Grasshoppers, and they see them as giants. Therefore, they can't, and you go to Hebrews chapter 4 to get this, they can't mix what they heard with faith. And Paul says, the, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, he says the reason why they didn't go in is because they didn't mix what they heard with faith. So you've got to pray to see. You've got to pray to hear. You gotta, you, so prayer is involved. But it's what you hear and what you see that you've got to mix it with faith to be able to walk it out. Because if you don't believe it, you're, not, you're, 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 you're going to have reasons why you don't do it. In this case, their identity kept them from going into the land and taking what was... Now, let me ask you this. Um, what got them into the... So you now go to the second generation. Remember, they all had to die out. What was so different between the first generation... And the second, that the second was able to go in there. Did they pray harder? Mm -hmm. Did they fast this time? I don't. I, I really don't know what the difference is, except they believed where the other one didn't believe. So can you say, if you're Israel, you did anything to get that? Or was that freely given? <laughs> and that you had to hear to go in? Because remember when they, they said, when they found out that they were the first generation, when they found out, oh, we're going to all die. In the wilderness. We changed our minds. We're not grasshoppers. We'll go take on those giants. And God said, too late. Your faith, you get you got faith now, but it's too late. And in Hebrews, what talks about entering the rest, in the heat in the Greek, it's like a day too late. They waited too long. They're over. They missed it. They missed their opportunity. And so it's going to be the second generation. So again, they're saying, I heard it, but this time it's not really faith. It's like I I guess if we're gonna die, I'd rather take the chance and die with these giants because I know we'll die back there because he says we will. Is that really faith then? I don't know. But my point is, 
Let's not think that you need anything special, that you need a talent, that you need education, that you need anything except hear what he's saying to you called call, and then do what you hear him say. Everyone, well, I'm not called. Everybody's called. He's not, Paul calls all of us ministers. So you're a minister. He calls all of us ambassadors. We represent him as ministers, and we all have a call. Your job is your call. We're not talking, you got to get this, well, I'm not full-time ministry. Get rid of that language. That's, 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 you don't see that in the Bible. I'm full-time. Timothy's not. There's no such thing. We're all ministers, and if, you're, if you've got a job that's not landing you within the four walls of a church, you're just as much a minister as the guy who's in the church when you're out there on the field doing what God's called you to do. That's why he said to all of us, at, be witnesses. Do you know what that means? Go to all the world and be witnesses? As you live your life, as you go to work, as you go play, as you go do what you do, be a witness. And you will be a witness because I will sh make sure you're a witness because I called you to that job. I gifted you with those talents and abilities to be at that place. Your job is the harvest field, is the, is the field. And you, you, you be the light there. You be the light in your family. You be a light when you're in the marketplace. You be the light wherever you go. And so all of us need to know that we're called, which should make all of us begin to start waiting on the Lord called prayer so that we can hear and step out in what he's saying and doing in our lives. If every Christian did that, we'd turn this world upside down. If you saw, if you said, I could be like that, then there's nothing this woman had that you don't have. There's nothing that he had. These guys had no... Sp this, this Seymour was a black guy that they had to step outside and, and, and listen to the, the <coughs> messages through, through an open window. He's, he's getting beaten down by Jim Crow laws. He, I mean, he really got a lot against him. And he was part of one of the greatest moves of God. All right? Evan Roberts, he's an old Welsh, uh, he, he's an old Welsh coal miner. Had to go back, he had to go work in the mines at 12 years old, remember. So, I mean, and, and Dowie, you know, he's all over the place, over in Australia and Scotland. But again, there's nothing major about him. Um, he may have been smarter than the rest of them, but... That meant IQ don't mean anything. What I'm saying is, and the reasons, again, I'm going to keep saying this, the reason why we're doing these meetings, these teachings, is because we're all responsible to carry the presence of God where we go. And when we carry the ark, the presence of God, there's man manifestations should be happening. I, I'm telling you, the devil has the church deceived. You can't raise the dead. God doesn't do that anymore. These are crazy manifestations. Don't get involved in that. Walk away. Run from that. That ain't for God. That's not happening. And, um, and so what's he do? Well, you get all of that. No wonder we're crippled. No wonder there's no fresh move of God happening. Because we've been lied to, to where we don't trust, believe, or even, who am I? That's the big one. Identity. I'm a grasshopper. What am I going to do? Well, they weren't grasshoppers, were they? Questions or comments? Um, I, I have a comment. You know, you see all these guys, but what the problem is, most people try to mimic or do exactly the things they done, but uh, God's not rep repetitious, so what we need to do is just ask God to open our eyes to. Yeah, why? Why would you know it's easier to to do what He's saying because because then I don't got to pray, I don't got to get a call. All I got to do is just mimic what others are doing, and I'm not doing it out of hearing. I'm not doing it out of faith. I'm doing it because I know how to do it. I know how. Well, I don't want to name names, but uh, one of the failing evangelists in the '80s or early '90s. Um, what his roommate came out and said once they found out that he was a swindler. He said, hey, I went to school with this guy. He said, you know there's a lot of money you can make being an evangelist? He says, all we got to do is just watch these guys on TV and mimic what they're doing. I mean, we don't got to prove anything. We just do it and say people got healed, this, that. He said, that's what he said to me. I heard that come out of his mouth. So this particular guy, 
And the reason I'm not going to say his name because that guy could be lying. But he did get found out to be a swindler. Um, but anyway, um, you, you, you get that. Or how about the guy? Here's one for you. Um, and this one I'll say because it was public. Is the guy that, you know, I don't know his name, so it doesn't matter. But he was on, but, but um, the guy who worked for Johnny Carson, he was the, like, the guy in the, that did the, uh, did you, you guys remember this? Hmm? No, no, no. This is a guy who worked behind the scenes. He, he was in, involved in the, in, the, um, in the control room. But anyway, this particular evangelist, uh, Peter Popoff. Peter Popoff. Oh, and so he, so Johnny Carson sent him, or he went on his own, but he, this guy, he set up his equipment where he could pick up mic, um, microphone signals. PA signal, you know. So, so he had it. He, he got on Carson, I think it was Carson, or someone of the, and he played it. And you could hear Popoff's wife in the background saying, okay, because what they do is they, they hand out these cards and say, put your name, where you live, and what your sickness is. Well, so she'd get these cards, go in the back, he's got this little thing in his ear, and she'd say, okay, uh, ask for a woman named Susie. She's got cancer, and she lives in Ohio. And he, and he said, he's, um, God's, to God's telling me there's a, there's a, 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 a Susie? There's a Susie, uh, oh, Ohio? Uh, and you got cancer. And the woman goes, oh my God! And, but he, you picked up all the, 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 the signal. He, he recorded it. So that, that's a guy who's not getting his call. That's a guy who's just doing what you're saying, mimicking the thing. And there's a lot of swindlers out there. You, ha you have that. You're going to have that. Satan plants those type of people. So what happens is if, there's, if there is a legitimate move of God, watch for the enemy to create a counterfeit to it. So you'll, you'll just say, screw it all. Walk away from it all. That's what happened with tongues. You know, tongues isn't popular with a lot of people because people got stupid with it. Didn't use it as the gift, but began to use it for, any, for whatever reason. And so anytime that there's any type of controversy, let the smoke roll back, get all the crazies out of it, and you're going to find a gem of truth there every single time. But anyway, but you're right. You, it, it, it's it's, it's got to be a, an authentic call. It can't be something you... And the fruit, the fruit will be there. Whereas Popoff, you know, he, didn't, he, he had to manufacture the fruit. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Lord, we come to you and ask God, help us to see the, to see the good, understand people aren't perfect, and not to throw the baby out with the bathwater with any of these people, but to look at what you're doing. You're no respecter of persons, and you can do it here, you can do it with us, and we want that. We want to see you move, and we understand the persecution that's going to come with it. It always does. We understand that the enemy will, will do things, and, and he'll, he'll do whatever he can. He'll throw everything at us, including the kitchen sink. But, Lord, we want to be part of what you're doing in this generation. This is the generation you've called us to, and this is the generation we're responsible with. So, Lord, help us break out of the box. Help us break out of our theology. Help us break out of our fears. Help us break out of, uh, out of everything that would hinder what the Spirit of God wants to do in this generation through each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.